What is going on, Solo fam? My name is John Solo, and welcome to the Messed Up Origins of Alice in Wonderland Part 2. Last episode, we recapped the Disney film, covered chapters 1, 2, and 3, and talked about Lewis Carroll and his fascination with children. If you haven't seen Part 1 yet, I highly recommend you watch it because there's some valuable context that you're gonna want. You can pause this video and either click right here or the link in the description to go to it. If you have seen Part 1, then you're good to go. Just sit back, relax, smash that like button to help us reach our goal of 10,000 likes and subscribe and ring that bell to be notified about new episodes of Messed Up Origins coming to your sub box every week. When we left off, Alice had just been abandoned by the group of animals that she swam through the pool of tears and dried off with. They had a good time running the caucus race and all, but as soon as Alice mentioned her cat Dinah and how she's so good at catching rats and mice, they noped out. Once again, Alice was alone, scared, and confused. But don't worry, it wasn't long before she was just scared and confused. She hears the frantic voice of the white rabbit growing louder, saying that he'll be executed by the Duchess as sure as ferrets are ferrets. Alice turns to look at the rabbit, and when he sees her, he shouts, Mary Ann! What are you doing out here? Go home and fetch me a pair of gloves and a fan. Now, we clearly have a case of mistaken identity here, but Alice is only seven years old, so when the rabbit yelled at her, she got scared and just ran in the direction that he was pointing. One thing I found really interesting is Carol said he wrote the rabbit to be the exact opposite of Alice's youth, audacity, vigor, and swift directness of purpose. In other words, he was elderly, timid, feeble, and nervously shilly-shallying, a phrase I had to Google. As we go on, you'll notice the rabbit has quite the pompous, demanding demeanor around those he thinks are below him, like his servants. But when he's around those who are higher than him in rank, he turns into a groveling kiss-ass. Oh, and speaking of servants, the name Mary Ann was chosen because back in those days, it was a British euphemism for servant girl. The more you know. Now in the movie, this missing glove situation is preceded by Alice running into Tweedledum and Tweedledee. But in actuality, Alice doesn't even meet them until her second adventure through the looking glass. And the same goes for the singing flowers. In the book, she goes straight from the shoreline to the rabbit's house. Now in Carol's first rendition of Alice's adventures, the rabbit tells her exactly where she can find him another pair of gloves and a bouquet of flowers on his dressing table, but in the final version she figures it out for herself. When she finds the gloves and fan on his dresser, she notices another little bottle filled with liquid. This one doesn't say drink me, but she drinks it anyway because she knows something interesting will happen and she's tired of being so small. She probably should have taken into account the last time she drank something she shrunk and the last time she shrunk she almost disappeared completely, but then again she said years old, so maybe I shouldn't be so critical. Somewhat luckily for Alice, she starts growing, but the reason I say somewhat is because she grows a bit more than she would have liked to and ends up filling the entire house with her body. So much so that when the rabbit arrives, he can't fit through any of the doors or windows. The first solution he thinks of is to chop off the arms and legs of whatever's in his house, but when he orders his servant Pat to do just that, Alice swats at him and scares him away. Shortly after, the rabbit orders a lizard named Bill to climb down the chimney and figure out who's in his house. But when Alice hears him slide down like Santa, she kicks him right back up the chimney with her foot that's jammed in there. He goes flying and lands on the ground with a thud. The animals stop focusing on the house for a second to make sure he's okay, while Alice is hoping they're out of ideas. But they're not just yet. The rabbit actually suggests they burn his house down, a plan he was quite opposed to in the film. But they decide against it when Alice says she'll stick her cat on them if they try. A few moments of silence pass when suddenly a barrel full of pebbles comes flying through the window and hits Alice in the face. After a minute, those pebbles start turning into cakes and Alice eats one because she figures she can't possibly get any bigger. Again, questionable logic, but again, seven years old. Well, it turns out she was right anyway. She shrinks right back down to being three inches tall and runs directly into the forest by the rabbit's house. In that forest, she comes across a giant puppy who at first intimidates her, but when she realizes he just acts like a normal puppy, she played with him until he got tired and laid down and then she moved on. Many commentators and Lewis Carroll fans feel that the puppy is the most out of place character in Wonderland on account of how normal he is. He's not unreasonably short-tempered, he's the size you would expect him to be in relation to a three-inch tall Alice, and he's the only important creature in Wonderland that doesn't speak to Alice. It's almost as if he wandered into her dream from the real world. Kind of weird, right? Well, after running away from him, she comes upon an interesting mushroom that's only a bit taller than her. She examines one side and then the other, and when she looks on top, she sees a caterpillar just chin-chilling, smoking hookah, and not taking any notice of her. 
Overall, the movie follows Alice's interaction with the caterpillar pretty accurately, meaning that he's just as big of a jerk in the book, if not a bigger one. After a few moments of silence, the caterpillar turns to look at Alice and says, who are you? The phrase, who are you, with emphasis on the you, may have been referencing a catchphrase that was popular in London for a short while in the 1800s. In the book, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, Charles McKay says the phrase came out of nowhere, appearing suddenly like a mushroom. One day it was unheard, the next day it pervaded London. Every newcomer into an alehouse tap room was asked unceremoniously, who are you? Carol is said to have owned that Charles McKay book, and it may have been what inspired him to include the phrase and the mushroom and the caterpillar scene. Anyways, the two proceed to have a conversation where the caterpillar disagrees with everything Alice says and repeatedly cuts her off just to make rude, disagreeable comments. Alice eventually gets sick of this, and who can blame her, so she starts to walk away when the caterpillar calls her back, claiming he has something important to say. That important thing? hold your temper, which in my experience is a very difficult statement to hold your temper to. Alice asks him if that's all he wanted and he says no. Then after another few minutes of silence, he says, what exactly is bothering you? She tells him that she doesn't feel like herself, that she can't remember things. So he has her recite a poem called You Are Old Father William to test her memory. As I mentioned last episode, in the movie, he tells her to recite How Doth the Little, but when she does so, he tells her she's got it all wrong, even though she doesn't. I'm not gonna go through the Father William poem line by line because it's an unnecessary detour on our adventures through Wonderland, but to summarize it, it's about a younger guy questioning why his elder father seems so weak and frail, but can still do random feats of strength and agility, like backward somersaults and standing on his head. In other words, it's a poem about old man strength. When she finishes reciting it, he tells her she got it wrong, and she defends herself saying that she doesn't remember it word for word. But then that disagreeable caterpillar doubles down and says, nah, it's wrong from beginning to end. Alice is getting really sick of this guy, but she needs needs all the help she can get. In her words, she wants to grow larger because three inches is such a wretched height. At first, the caterpillar is really offended because he's three inches tall exactly, but he calms down after taking a few more hits from the hookah. And then he proceeds to quietly crawl down the mushroom away from Alice into the grass. On his way out, he yells back that one side of the mushroom will make Alice grow larger and the other will make her shrink. And then she's left alone to figure it out for herself. Another difference in the original Alice's adventures underground, he tells her that the top of the mushroom will make her grow larger and the stalk will make her grow shorter. She takes a piece off each side and then tries each one. The first one makes her shrink in such a peculiar way that her head stays the same size while her body gets smaller. The second one makes her grow, or more specifically, it makes her neck grow like the body of a snake. As you might guess, the forest is not the ideal place for this to happen. Her head is rising through the trees and above the tree line when out of nowhere a pigeon attacks her, thinking that she's a serpent trying to steal her eggs. Alice tries explaining to the bird that while she has eaten eggs before, she's not a serpent, but the bird doesn't care. She has eaten eggs before, ipso facto, she must be a serpent, right? Alice says that regardless, she doesn't want her eggs because she doesn't like them raw. Then the pigeon flies back to her nest and tells Alice to buzz off. After weaving her way back down through the trees, Alice eats just enough of the shrinking mushroom to return her to her normal height. Shortly after, she comes across a wide open space with a little house in the center that's about four feet high. Knowing that she would terrify anyone in there with her normal height, she ate some more of the shrinking mushroom and shrunk herself down to nine inches high. So about 80% of this chapter is not in the movie. The first 80% is a matter of fact, and I think as we go through it, you'll understand why. After Alice shrinks herself down, she sees a footman, which basically means butler, running up to the house and knocking on the door, and then another footman answers. It should be mentioned that one of the footmen had a frog head, the other had a fish head, and both were wearing powdered wigs. The fish man tells the frog man he's delivering an invitation from the queen to the duchess to play croquet. After the frog man accepts, the two bow to each other and actually bow so low, their wigs get tangled together. After that mess got sorted out, the frogman sat on the ground, and Alice walked right by him to knock on the door of the house. The frogman says knocking is pointless for two reasons. One, he's on the same side of the door as her, and two, they're making such a racket inside, they'd never be able to hear her knocking anyways. After an irritating conversation that ends with Alice calling him perfectly idiotic, she just opens the door and goes inside. The door leads right to the kitchen, which holds one of the strangest sights you ever did see. It was full of smoke from one 
one end to the other. The Duchess was sitting on a three-legged stool in the middle, nursing a baby. The cook was leaning over the fire, stirring a large cauldron, which seemed to be full of soup. You can probably figure this out from the picture, but it's later revealed that Alice finds the Duchess very ugly. John Tenniel's illustration of her is thought to be inspired by Quentin Matsey's painting of the ugly Duchess, Margaret Countess of Tyrol, who had the reputation of being the ugliest woman in history when she ruled in the 1300s. This was obviously way before Takashi 69 was born, otherwise they would have thought differently. Anyway, as soon as Alice enters the kitchen, she can tell there's too much pepper in the air because the cook won't stop pouring it into the soup. Alice is sneezing like crazy, the Duchess is sneezing, the baby is alternating between crying and sneezing, the only ones not sneezing are the cook and the Cheshire cat that's laying on the ground. While Alice is thinking about what subject to talk about with the Duchess, the cook starts grabbing every object within reach and throwing it over her shoulder at the Duchess and the baby. Fire irons, plates, silverware, some of them even hit them, but oddly enough, the Duchess didn't react and the baby was crying so much already, it was hard to tell whether the plates were hurting it or not. Alice then listens to the Duchess sing a strange lullaby to her baby, where after every line, she would shake it violently. And then during the second verse, she aggressively tossed it up and down. That poem, which is about beating your son when he sneezes, is a parody of another poem that preaches the exact opposite values. Carol was funny like that. As soon as her lullaby's over, she throws her infant son to Alice and says to hold him for a while because she has to go play croquet with the queen. Now, Alice doesn't exactly want the ugly baby, but she knows that if she leaves him behind, he'll definitely be killed by the neglectful people around him. She carries him outside into the fresh air and then to the woods. The baby eventually stops crying and sneezing, which you would think was a good thing, but then it starts grunting and transforms into a pig. Alice lets the pig run away because she's not going to spend a bunch of time and energy carrying a pig around. Remember how last episode we talked about Lewis Carroll's extreme interest in children? Well, it's widely believed that Carroll made the baby turn into a pig because of his distaste for little boys. He once wrote in his journal, I am fond of children except boys. Pretty weird thing to say, right? I like kids except for half of them. Sounds to me that you just like little girls then, dude. Apparently very few of his child friends were boys and on the rare occasion he did befriend one, that boy usually had sisters that Carol wanted to meet. Okay, I didn't even try to make that one sound creepy. It just is. Moving on, Alice continues on her way through the woods when she runs into the Cheshire Cat sitting in a tree. Their conversation plays out very similar to the movie. Alice asks him where to go from here. She doesn't have a specific destination in mind, she just wants to go somewhere. The cat points out that you're surely to get somewhere if you walk long enough, and Alice knows that she can't deny that, so she rephrases her question to ask who lives around there. He tells her that in one direction lives the March Hare, and in the other lives the Hatter, and they're both mad. Alice complains that she doesn't want to be around mad people, and the cat responds, you can't help it, everyone's mad around here. You're mad, I'm mad, everyone's mad. He then asks her if she's ever played croquet with the queen. She says she hasn't, and he says that he'll see her there, and vanishes. Alice thinks she's alone again when the cat reappears to ask what happened with the baby. She told him it turned into a pig, and he responds, that's what I thought, and then disappears again. She stood there for a moment, expecting the cat to come back, but when he didn't, she started walking. And then the cat appeared in another tree to ask, did you say pig or fig? Alice responds, I said pig, but I'd really appreciate it if you stopped disappearing and reappearing so suddenly. The cat says fine, and this time slowly fades away, starting with his tail and ending with his grin. It's here that Alice delivers the famous line, I've often seen a cat without a grin, but a grin without a cat? It's the most curious thing I ever saw in all my life. It isn't much longer before she stumbles upon the house of the March Hare, which has two chimneys to look like rabbit ears and a roof that's covered in fur. She was a little scared to walk on the property of a mad person, so she ate some of the growing mushroom so she'd be about two feet high and then started walking towards the house. And what a perfect ending to today's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed hearing it as much as I liked sharing it. Make sure you tune in next week because we'll be diving into one of the most iconic scenes in all of Alice, the Mad Tea Party. As for this episode though, what chapter was your favorite? I would say chapter five with the caterpillar. He was just so rude. I know most of the characters in Wonderland are, but he did it in a way that was funnier than the rest. Like when Alice would end her explanations with you know and you see, he would say, I don't know and I don't see. He doesn't have to say that. The phrases are rhetorical, but he does it anyway, and I like it. Make sure to comment your thoughts on that chapter as well as all the rest down below and smash that like button like the cook smashes plates. If you want to be notified when the next episode of Messed Up Origins is available, subscribe and ring that bell. In addition to the Alice series, I'm working on not just one, but two highly requested episodes that I know you guys aren't going to want to miss. And as always, make sure to follow me on social media to stay updated on Messed Up Origins news, submit video recommendations, or 
or just say what's up. Thank you all for watching Solo Fam. I'll be seeing you very soon, probably even sooner than you think. Until next time, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.